delighted that Fab- Fabrice has been able to, to join us. Um, his book is now available, isn't it? Um, so you can go and have a look at that on, on Amazon. Um, what Fabrice has, has done uh, with his business partner is he's created uh, quite a tech company and, um, and has just written a book, uh, basically getting people in the agile world to think about how they can scale. Hello everyone, uh, so yeah, I'm here today to share with you the Lean Tech Manifesto. Um, there will be some book promotion in it. Um, uh, so my goal is to help you, the Lean community, understand how you can uh, apply your expertise and experience in the tech industry, but also share with you what I, some of the things I think Lean can learn from, from the tech industry. And so my story starts uh, quite a long time ago uh, during a Lean study tour uh, in Japan that was organized by Michael Ballet. Uh, so a lot of you probably know Michael. He's the four times Shingo Award of uh, uh, winning author of multiple reference books on Lean. And so we were on the bus. When you do Lean study tours, you spend quite a lot of time in the bus uh, between factories. And we were having a debate so I'm very glad I have a picture of that debate. So as you can see, it's a very tense debate. Um, and we were having a debate about the Agile Manifesto. So the Agile Manifesto is, um, for those of you who don't know what it is, um, the software industry was really booming in the 90s. And um, there's quite a few people that around the same time wanted to change the way software was built. And they met in 2001 and agreed on four principles that they shared in common, and they called it the Agile Manifesto, and it's been an incredible uh, document to help uh, Agile become very, very big uh, in the following, well, 20 odd years. And so, anyway, Michael's point was, the Agile Manifesto is not scalable. Uh, And I was very defensive about this uh, for two reasons. Uh, The first reason is, that there are a lot of large organizations that are agile, so I didn't really understand what what Michael meant by the Agile Manifesto is not scalable. And I guess the second reason is just that our agile transformation had been such a game changer for us, I was very much in love with agile, and so I was just being like, you know, stupidly defensive. But I think what what was very interesting and, and, you know, what Michael got really right with this is that Yes, there are uh, agile cultures that have scaled. Large organizations have agile cultures. Um, but they definitely didn't use the Agile Manifesto for that um, because the Agile Manifesto, the four principles that you know, these, these uh, 12 people uh, uh, put together were really not designed for scale and the principles in it do not scale. Um, however, again, being quite a, a, a proponent of agile, I wanted to prove Michael wrong. And so I wanted to show him that, okay, fine, the principles do not scale, but, you know, there's ways you can rephrase them that is scalable and true to the spirit of the Agile Manifesto. And so I went, um, and oh yeah, by the way, just one point. I mean, the, the kind of demonstration that everything that Michael was saying is right is I wouldn't have been in the Lean Study Tour in the first place if I had found all my answers in Agile, huh? obviously. And the reason I'm, I'm in the Lean community today is because Agile was not, not, not enough for us. Anyway, so I, I wanted to prove him wrong, and that's how the journey to find principles that scale and are true to the spirit of Agile Manifesto started. And uh, I don't say how many years later, uh, it's ending now with the release of the Lean Tech Manifesto, which is available now in the UK. And it's been it's been available in US for uh, slightly longer. It came out like a month ago, so we're starting to have a few feedbacks already. It seems to like. Uh, um, have very good feedback from lean practitioners who have to interact with tech leaders. Um, the good thing also about having feedback from Americans is they, uh, it's not half-hearted. <laughs> so <laughs> I couldn't help but share this like very American feedback. My plan is to tear a hundred dollar bill in half and present it to my VPs in tech and tell them they get the other half when they've read the book. Uh, so I hope uh, you will have the same feeling when you read the book. <laughs> in the meantime, let me give you a brief summary of what it's about and, and some context. Um, and so to do that, probably uh, I, I need to start by explaining what Agile uh, meant for to us and what makes it so popular. 
Uh, and for that, uh, let's go back to the beginning. So this is 2007, this is Benoit and I, uh, we, were, uh, we just started our entrepreneurial journey and we really wanted to start a company just to not work in a bureaucracy. So really the two, the two ideas was one, uh, create a company to which we would have liked to apply and in the industry we're passionate about, which is uh, technology. And so we started by uh, building a first uh, product uh, that was called Allomatch.com which was the website and later the app to find venues to watch sports. So typical example, you have to travel to France, I don't know, for the Lean Summit in Paris, and you have to watch this Liverpool Man United game, then you can go on Allomatch and find all the pubs that not only show the game, but, you know, side for Liverpool and for so Manchester. Like Everton tonight. Mm -hmm. yeah, or, um, Everton v Liverpool. But you're not in Paris tonight, are you? No, no, I've got okay. <laughs> So there's, we've actually been, Allomatch has been acquired by um, Fanzo, and Fanzo is the UK uh, equivalent, so you can actually go on Fanzo if you want to find a pub in Liverpool. Um, so today we still do the same job, so uh, the company is now Theodo, uh, we're a tech consultancy, and so we build products for clients. A few examples just to understand a bit what we do. Um, so we worked in the banking industry, for example, we've built the whole digitalization of the credit factory of a bank. We have quite a few clients in healthcare, a uh, very nice app where uh, we collect wound healing data. Uh, so for a leading healthcare company, there's actually a, um, they published a paper that said we had saved a leg thanks to the app, uh, helping like nurses better uh, take care of wounds. Um, I, didn't, I didn't think I would save a leg by coding, but apparently that, well, that works. And we've also worked in the energy industry, so uh, typically a, a Quite an amazing example was we built machine learning algorithms to detect um, or, or like oil drilling risks, so basically prevent accidents from happening on offshore oil rigs. So this is this is uh, what we do. And so the start, well, when you launch a company and you're like very young, uh, at the beginning it's actually very nice. Everything's going well. We recruit, so we started. We were two, and soon enough we were dozens, and soon enough we were like a bit more than a dozen. And we, we were growing, it was amazing, it looked, it looked really big at the time. Um, but, you know, what happens when you have an organization is really quickly you have problems that start to accumulate. Uh, this is uh, typically a, a funny reminder of the time. So it's a, an email from an angry client. So we had clients that were more and more unhappy and, and we're losing money on certain projects. And, uh, and I guess what was like not giving us a lot of hope at the time, is that we, all these problems were managed directly by, by Benoit and I. So we're looking for advice and, you, well, you're very young, so you, you get typical advice, which is, well, you know, that's normal, it's human beings, what you have to do is put processes in place and also like put a hierarchy in place to like supervise the processes. And so we're thinking, oh, wow. Well, if that's the only way, then you know we're back to square one. We basically just created a bureaucracy despite just being like you know 30 employees. Um, but luckily, this is around the time that I attended my first Agile Open. So an ad, it was a three-day long conference in the middle of the countryside with uh, pioneers of Agile. Um, I found this very nice picture, which I think describes well the atmosphere. Everybody in shorts and post-its. Um, in shorts playing with process, yeah. Um, and this, you know, we thought we had been doing Agile, but basically these Agile pioneers convinced me that you know, we had to do it by the book, and then we'd finally see the value. Uh, and so yeah, we decided to really apply Scrum by the book. We did uh, you know, add principles from extreme programming and, and DevOps and Lean Startup, um, and that, with that we created the Theodore Agile team, and it was a game changer. And we really discovered the magic of Agile. And um, I think, I think that's what is amazing about Agile is it's not easy, but it's not that complex either. You know, it's, there's, there's some recipes, if you implement them well, at a small scale, which is the scale of one software engineering team, and you really put the clients, the business experts, in the middle of the team, you know, with a team of, of engineers, competent engineers, then what you get is a much better product. You get these ingenious ideas that you know solve problems in <coughs> such better ways than you had would have expected on both sides, engineering and, and business side. And um, and yeah, and you get a happy client, 
because that you know they get a much better product. They're very happy. It's not the only reason they're happier also because they 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 they're part of a team. So you know all of a sudden the team success is their success. Uh, they see value delivered daily on a daily basis. They see you know immediate problem solving. That's that's really like it's quite, it's quite an amazing experience from the client side. And you get the engaged team because of course uh, they have autonomy. Um, they interact directly with the client. Before that, I would have engineers like complain about what the client said. Well, now, now they could complain directly to the client. So they usually complain much more constructively and, and came up with like amazing solutions. So that was great. And um, yeah, and so they could see, of course, the impact of their work. So agile, amazing experience, uh, uh, you know, everything going much better. That magic turned into real business value. So if you look at the year we implemented agile, the following year we had almost trebled the revenue. And um, Angela was amazing because it helped us grow the number of project teams very easily. Before there was a big constraint, which was me being the firefighter, for example, on the tech side, and Benoit being the firefighter, let's say, on the project management side. All of a sudden, we had these autonomous teams, and we could just add one for every new client. So that was really amazing. Um, what wasn't really clear is how we could be agile outside of the software teams. And okay, you could kind of invent stuff around that, but more importantly, we couldn't find in Agile the, um, the answers to the challenges of scaling uh, the whole company. And this is where we go back to, to Michael's point, which was these answers are not in the Agile manifesto. Um, so let me now basically redo the conversation of, of that time in the Japanese bus. Um, so this is the Agile manifesto, for those of you who don't know it. So it's four principles um, that really capture what makes an amazing, high-performing, small team uh, working in you know quick, quick iterations. Um, and let's look at you know every every one of them individually. So the first one: individual interactions over processes and tools. So there's really this idea that you know. If you want to not be bureaucratic, if you want to avoid processes, well, one easy way is to rely and trust trust the people to do a good job uh, and between themselves. That's a very agile principle. Mathematically, there's a bit of an issue, which is the number of interactions grows to the square of the individuals. So basically, in a very large organization, saying, okay, guys, just just deal with it on your own as individuals is, is, is not going to be a very um, a very useful guideline. The next one, working software over comprehensive documentation. So this, this was really a reaction at, to the way software was built at the time, which was, let's spend months specifying perfectly what the software should be, and then we'll start building it. And, and the Agile community was reacting to that and saying, oh, can't we just ship software and you know, ship updates and, and, and work in an iterative way, and that's going like, to result in much better products much earlier. But again, what, what happens if you scale the software project and you end up having a lot of teams com contributing to the same project, and even if they all are, if they all work in an agile way and work all work in an iterative way, what you observe very quickly is that the increments start being mixed together, and because of dependencies, you end up having uh, sprints that contain only just a part of features, and then of course that means you can't really uh, deploy them to production. Uh, because you're missing, <laughs> you're missing, you're always missing a part somewhere. So your working software, great, great principle, doesn't get wrong at scale, but again, doesn't tell you how to tackle the complexity of, of large software projects. Customer, uh, customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Well, as I said, this was really what one of the things I found the most amazing when we implemented Agile correctly, which is you get this, this like all these ingenious ideas from having all the disciplines in the same team. But what happens if you scale this? Well, you know, if instead of one decision maker on the business side, you start having multiple stakeholders, and what happens if to deliver the product you have to have multiple teams, then it's really hard to see how you can just say, oh, you know, we'll, we'll deal with it by collaborating, because then, you, then you're like, yeah, but how do we collaborate? <clears throat> and the final uh, principle of the Agile Manifesto, responding to change over following a plan. Um, 
So I was thinking, what does it mean at scale? And I found that the best uh, metaphor is probably a metaphor. It's not a metaphor, actually. The best illustration would be this flight of uh, Starling. Um, so what I discovered is this flight of Starling, so lo loads of birds, and apparently it's only like two, three birds that decide where to move. And in, in a matter of one or two seconds, the whole flight, uh, the whole group of birds know where to go and like change direction instantly. So I was thinking, can, is there an organization where any team can just like, you know, respond to change and get the whole organization to like immediately follow them? Uh, well, I've never seen such an organization. I imagine that if it ever existed, it didn't survive natural selection. Um, and it's probably because like, you know, the thought experiment just doesn't work because a change uh, that impacts multiple teams uh, needs to build on the context of these teams, on the past learnings. So you, so, so you end up with like the traditional way of dealing with it, which is either no change or change coming from the top, which is often less well informed, much slower to implement, etc. <coughs> so this is the demonstration that you know Michael's point was right. The, the Agile Manifesto is not doesn't contain principles that apply in large organizations. Um, so when we were faced with this challenge of saying, okay, how do we how do we you know maintain that magic of agile, but you know at, as we scale and across the whole organization, um, and we were thinking, okay, what does it mean? Like, are we back to you know, square one again? We're just like a bureaucracy, slightly bigger. Um, luckily, that's the time when we um, met a lean coach, Antoine Contal, and he said. You know, he's, he told us, I went through the same thought process and I found the solution, and the solution is lean thinking. And so we're like, great, you know, let's, let's try that. And um, what is very interesting in, you know, for, for, for Antoine or for us is that indeed when you dig into the history of the Agile Manifesto and you try to really, you know, define what the essence of Agile is, um, there's this interesting um, definition which is, um, you know, at the core, it's about delivering good products to customers by operating in an environment that actually acts as if people were the most important. And, and it's, it's very, very, very similar, if not exactly the same purpose as lean thinking. So here I'm taking another definition. Um, lean thinking combats big company disease by spurring manager thinking to provide meaningful work to people who work mindfully in order to always deliver better value for customers. So if what you're looking for is something that feels agile at scale, then you're like, wow, you know, this is amazing. Lean thinking shares the same purpose and it works at scale. I think this is, of course, not a coincidence. Uh, agile has been heavily influenced by lean. Um, one, you know, connection, if you want to prove your uh, agile uh, colleagues wrong, or that, you know, is uh, Scrum. Scrum come, is, is really the leading influence of the agile movement. Um, the, the paper that really you know, kind of uh, formalized it from 1995 um, clearly connects it to uh, the, uh, an article by Takeuchi and Nonaka, who had studied innovation practices at different Japanese companies, including Toyota. So you can see the, the link between lean thinking and Scrum. Uh, maybe less well known, uh, but some leading tech entrepreneurs in the US have also directly been influenced by lean. Um, if you haven't seen it, there's this amazing interview uh, from Steve Jobs when he's at Next, so in 1990, explaining uh, how after he got fired by Apple and was looking for ways to um, create a culture that would support his high uh, standards of quality, he uh, got put in contact uh, with uh, Dr. Jurin and was coached by him, uh, Dr. Jurin being the leading influence of uh, quality practices in Japan alongside uh, Deming. So Steve Jobs really had like a uh, direct connection to, to the whole lean thinking. Um, another example is Jeff Bezos. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's written in Working Backwards, for example, that he studied the Toyota way in the early 2000s. There's a very funny anecdote of him like implementing an undone in customer service. Um, and then it scaled that because he hired lean expert Mark Neto in 2006 as SVP Worldwide Operations and uh, Customer Service. So long story short, 
we did find in lean thinking what we were looking for when we were trying to scale and you know maintain this agile culture and so that's why we've been on a lean journey for the past 10 years uh, we uh, are very grateful to lean thinking for uh, very good business results um, because in the last uh, 10 years we grew from 3 million revenue to 90 million revenue we're now about 700 people in the company and to come back to trying to uh, prove uh, Mike are wrong. Um, that's also that's also why I started looking in lean thinking for the principles that would help me rephrase the Agile Manifesto. Um, so here it is, uh, me trying to rephrase the Agile Manifesto using our ten years of experience uh, and you know scaling with with Agile and Lean. So what do you do when you see the Agile Manifesto and you have some lean experience? The first thing you do is you reorder it because you need to put uh, customer first. So here it is. And then um, I go really quickly because, of course, you, you know lean really well. Um, but if you're looking for a principle that describes putting, really caring for what the customer uh, needs, uh, but doesn't, you know, isn't, hasn't the bottleneck of having to collaborate directly for the, with the customer, well, there's actually the first principle of lean thinking, which is value for the customer. Um, I'll skip the second one, go straight to the third one. So again, if you're looking for a way to say, okay, we want to deliver super high quality continuously, well, there are principles in lean thinking for that. It's right first time and just in time over working software. And, um, and if you're also looking for a principle to say, okay, we want to adapt to the inputs of the market, you know, changing conditions, uh, but we don't want to do it like, you know, just randomly we want to build on, on past learnings well then you know in lean thinking you've got standards you've got you've got kaizen and if you don't want to use a japanese word you can say building a learning organization so this is uh, probably why one of the reactions after my talk uh, from the lean community was like ah i always knew that lean is better than agile uh, so <laughs> Um, it's not my only message, right? I, I do think that lean thinking is, is the thing to study when you want to scale agile. Uh, but one of the things I also realized is I was actually struggling a lot more to um, find a principle that was purely lean thinking and to, to capture this like individual in, interactions uh, concept at scale. And I was particularly interested in some organization that looked, that were very agile, that were very large, and that didn't feel very lean. And so I decided to look at them more closely and, um, and you know, trying to share with you what, what tech adds to the mix. So one of the most iconic example of an organization that is large and has scaled, you know, scaled individuals and interactions um, is, is probably uh, Linux. So Linux is an open source project. So all the contributors are doing it, not, not all of them now, but most of them on their free time. So Linux is a project that started in 1991, uh, started by a Finnish student called Linus Torvalds, who posted a message on the internet saying, oh, I've got this like hobby. What's the sentence exactly? It's, um, I'm doing a free operating system. It's just a hobby. It won't be big and professional. Um, turns out that 30 years later, Linux powers 100%, so really 500 of the top 500 supercomputers in the world. It powers 96% of the top 1 million web servers. It powers 4 billion smartphone users. So it's actually quite a bit more professional than expected. And uh, interestingly, on uh, you know scaling, it's uh, it has been 55,000 contributors uh, in, in total over the 30 years. And and I'm not sure we can really describe uh, uh, the, the Linux kernel organization as, as, as following lean principles. So I thought, you know, let's, let's look at what they did. And clearly, scaling to communicate, accumulated 55,000 contributors was not without its challenges. That didn't happen by magic. So I, I, I was very interested in these two, in, this, like, in the scaling crisis. There was in particular two. So the first one is 1996. It's made explicit by Linus saying that he's buried alive in email because at the time, which is quite crazy to imagine, but he was really the bottleneck. So every contribution was uh, checked for uh, checked by him and merged by him. So that included like quality control and you know making sure it worked together, etc. So the the first two changes to address that were 
transforming the architecture, so both technical and, and, and let's say, uh, people side. Um, so they introduced something called the loadable kernel modular architecture, but the idea is they made the architecture much, much modular, which allowed you know, people to, to, which reduced a bit the dependencies and the issues for when you had contributions in different parts of the code. And it was also the, um, when they created the official rule of maintainers. So basically, quality control on modules was uh, delegated, uh, or at least it was a first pass uh, done by the maintainers. So that worked for a while, not, not so long. Um, because soon after, scaling issues restarted. Um, I think it was the first time the word burnout was used. Linus stopped working for a few days. That was quite incredible. Um, he also said he was very fed up with people, but that... That is normal for him, so don't, don't, that was not the main issue. Um, and what is interesting is that scaling uh, issue uh, inspired uh, one of the contributors, Larry McVoy, to create BitKeeper. So BitKeeper was a technology that was going to make distributed collaboration on software much better. Um, and it took him some time to build it, and then it took some time for the Linux community to actually adopt it. But, um, and in the meantime, problems continued, um, contributions were lost, so that was very frustrating, can you imagine? You do a lot of work and then the work is lost. Um, until in 2002, Linus decided to adopt BitKeeper and the situation immediately improved and, and basically has been working well since then. So really, that's very interesting. It's Big, big scaling issue actually solved by, by technology here. If you wonder why you've never heard of this like magical technology called BitKeeper, there's actually a funny story around it. In 2005, Larry threatened to revoke the free license. So Linus was a bit pissed off and took a few weeks off, created Git to, as a free replacement to BitKeeper. And now I would say 98% of software in the world is using Git as a collaboration technology. Uh, so I guess the more of the story is, one, Linus is incredibly, you know, very, very strong. <laughs> and second, don't piss him off. Um, so there's not been any other scaling challenges since. And I guess if we were trying to capture, like, at, at the concept level what happened, um, there's two things. There's this idea that at some point they had to kind of distribute the work and to work as a network of teams. So... Um, that's typically what happened with like the modular architecture and, and the um, and the maintainer role. And here's a video of like how people contribute to Linux. And um, yeah, you can. It's not very visible, but there's like you, know, you can see that there's, there's like little um, pockets of people working on certain aspects, and then everything is connected together. Um, and then the other thing is is the technology, because really. This, this ability to work as a, as a distributed network of teams uh, is, was made possible by technologies. So first the modular architecture, but also the, the creation of Git, which is really now everywhere in the software industry. And, when I, um, and once I had identified this pattern, I actually started seeing it in every large organization with, with agile cultures. So um, one iconic agile organization, Burtzor, uh, he studied in the, um, the book uh, Reinventing Organization. It's a Dutch healthcare company. Um, and it's, the idea of Burtzor is you have like little teams of nurses that are fully autonomous um, to uh, care about the patients in the neighborhood. Uh, but when I met with Joost de Bloch, I was like quite keen to understand how that was actually made possible. And he confirmed that they had built a tech platform and really from the start to reduce all the usual admin tasks of nurses and empower them on their PL. Um, so it's really this idea that it doesn't talk a lot about it, but there's actually technology uh, allowing then the, the teams to be very autonomous. Um, it's also something you can see in the history of Amazon. It's very well documented in, in the book Working Backwards. It's something that's been known on the internet as the API mind date. And the idea was at some point, Amazon was really struggling because it was one, one big monolith and you know, hundreds of teams contributing to the same thing, so having these dependencies and you know, if you needed to change the one column in the database, you probably had to wait three or four months to get approval and make sure that all the other teams were synchronized. And so the idea, they were saying, okay, how can we communicate better? How we can... And the very interesting intuition of Jeff Bezos at the time was like, ah, you know, if we want Amazon to be a place where builders can build, we need to eliminate communication, not encourage it. 
And you know, the solution to eliminate communication is technology. So software teams should build and, and clearly document a set of APIs. So that's APIs is for application programming interfaces. So really like tech interfaces uh, that all the system and services uh, can use. Um, another example, um, Tesla has been heavily investing in modularity of the architecture. So this is a video, a recent video of them like going even further. Um, so this is apparently the, the new process they aim to have soon. So very, very modular. Um, you can also find it in a team of teams. Um, so this is the story of the general uh, Stanley McChrystal talking. Uh, so he was leading the Joint Special Operation Forces in Iraq. And you know, despite the incredible power of the uh, US Army, they were completely uh, uh, powerless against the insurgents because they were very bureaucratic. And one of the things he did to really try to turn this around was share, share information very widely. And one of the key things he used for that was a daily video conference uh, so to share the information so that the teams on the ground could be empowered and execute without having to always wait for orders. <coughs> And I think this approach um, where technology helps uh, works because what we're trying to achieve is scaling individual interactions. So it's basically about keeping this little team spirit, like the, 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 the magic of empowered teams, um, despite as the company, as the organization scales, uh, more and more dependencies between teams. And what large agile organizations have managed to do is like solve this this. Uh, uh, challenge with technology. So basically reducing the dependencies, or at least reducing the, 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 the dependencies that required human communication by actually replacing it with technology to, to distribute work over the network. So that's why uh, for this uh, principle, instead of using something that is purely lean thinking, we came up with a tech-enabled network of teams. Ta-da, this is the Lean Tech Manifesto. So this is what you get when you put, you know, agile, lean, and tech in the in the pan, and cook it for quite a few years. Um, why why did we create this manifesto? Not just to prove Michael wrong. Um, I, for us, like for Benoit and I, I think we we the reason we did this is because we um, really believe that lean thinking is amazing, is is revolutionary in helping organizations become more ingenious at scale. We also think that you know our world currently needs more ingenuity. So we'd love to have lean thinking in more organizations. But we also see a gap. Uh, this is me trying to find some data around that. But you can see on Google Trends how yeah, Agile has, has been doing better in terms of, of uh, trendiness uh, compared to lean. Um, and so when, I, when we see a gap, uh, quick problem solving. Um, I think hypothesis number one, when you're in business, you know that the most important factor is always the market. And clearly, Agile has a market advantage. This is um, the comparison of the MSCI World Industrial Index and the MSCI World IT Index. So you can see that over the last 10 years, there's been a, a 3x um, difference in terms of growth. Um, hypothesis number two: Agile is more accessible. What what you know? What the twelve uh, authors of the Agile Manifesto have done incredibly well is is capture and something that is very easy to share, very easy to remember uh, the essence of of what Agile stood for versus lean thinking, which is this gigantic body of knowledge, and on top of that, it's got some Japanese words, so it's not it's not the most accessible sometimes. Uh, so I guess once we say these are you know two key hypotheses, maybe a countermeasure to deploy lean thinking more widely to more organizations to bring it to the tech industry, so benefit from the market dynamic, and and also bring it in a more accessible way. So you know, for example, write a lean tech manifesto. Um, so that's it. I hope the lean tech manifesto will contribute to more ingenious organizations, and uh, it's now available in the UK if you want to order it. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for the latest lean content.